to Almighty God for giving us yet another opportunity that we might gather here for the purpose of worshiping him in spirit and truth. We are certainly grateful that God has given us yet another day for we recognize that God is better to us than we've ever been to ourselves. And we know that our God is worthy to be praised. I said God is worthy to be praised. He's, he's an awesome God. And not only because of what he does, but because of who he is. Uh, I said not only because of what he does. Some of us just praise him because of what he does. But I want to suggest to you, God, to suggest to you that God is worthy on the basis of just who he is. Uh, when you think about the character of God, that God is holy, holy, holy. Uh, we know that God is just worthy uh, to be praised and he's worthy to be honored. Uh, and you have to just recognize that God, just on the basis of his person, is absolutely holy and reverent. And we appreciate that God is just that good. I remember when uh, Barack Obama was running for office, and I had an opportunity to go to Jacksonville, Florida, to do a gospel meeting. Uh, and the preacher there got me some tickets to go to a rally uh, with my wife and my children. At that time, it was just Nevaeh. And I remember going to that rally, and uh, the people in the rally were just getting absolutely excited in as much as he was running uh, for president for his first term. And as he was running, we were in that rally, and everybody was just jumping and hollering and getting all excited. Uh, and my daughter, uh, young at the time, said, Daddy, why is everybody screaming? Uh, and I said, baby, it's because of who he is. Uh, and then, of course, I explained to her that he was going to be the first African-American president. And I tried to explain that the history of the moment, uh, it was because of who he was to history, uh, that everybody was shouting and screaming and getting excited. And, and then, lo and behold, uh, they said Barack had come into the building and it got real quiet and silent. And she said, Daddy, why is everybody so quiet? And I said, Baby, it's because of who he is. Uh, and so she said, uh, she said, Daddy, well, what are we waiting for? I said, we're waiting for him to come in. And when he came in, uh, electricity ran through the place and everybody stood up on their feet and hollered and lifted their hands and erupted in shouts. And before long, I stood up and I got excited and I started lifting my hands and shouting. And my, my daughter looked at me and said, Daddy, why are you so excited? I said, baby, because of who he is. Uh, and then I stopped in a moment in time and I said, if I could get this excited over a man that's done nothing for my salvation, then I know somebody else that I can stand up and shout on and say, thank you, Jesus, for all that he's done for me. If I can shout on a sinner, then I know I can shout on Jesus Christ. And I've come today to tell you the church ought to be willing uh, to shout on King Jesus. And so we're just thankful to see all of you here. Uh, always a pleasure to come. Uh, to the heights, uh, particularly during this time, uh, in as much as you engage in a one month uh, celebration of this man of God that labors here, the mouthpiece that labors in this congregation that has been a blessing to us across the country, uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, Dr. W.F. Washington is a preacher's preacher. And, and I'm just grateful uh, to say that he's my daddy twice. He's my daddy in the faith, but he's my daddy in law, and just appreciate so much uh, the deposit that he's made in my life. Uh, as, as far as God has taken me, uh, all the preaching I've done across the country, all of the things that I've accomplished, uh, the one thing I always look back to, had it not been for his training, and had it not been for his deposit, I would not be doing what I'm doing today. And so I love him to a fault. If you know something bad, don't tell me because I'll cut you. I'll lose my Jesus over my daddy. Uh, so I just love him so much and just appreciate him uh, for all that he's done for me. Good to have another Atlanta preacher in the house, uh, Brother Keaton uh, from the Boulder Crest Church. Good friend of mine. We call him the preacher with unparalleled swagger uh, from Atlanta, Georgia. Ain't nobody got swagger like Brother Keaton. And we just appreciate him for being here. Came in to check on Pop uh, and make sure he was all right. And we just appreciate so much uh, his love uh, for Pop and his love for the kingdom of God. Uh, kids are fine. Wife is fine. She's spending money great. Um, 
kids acting crazy, everything is just normal. Uh, and so we just thank God for all that God is doing. Good to see mama, always good to lay eyes on her uh, and good to uh, see her in good health and appreciate her so much as well. Now I'm almost finished. Uh, Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight. Romans the eighth chapter. If you don't mind, I want to move very methodically and carefully as we move through this particular pericope. We want to do it exegetically according to the author's intent. But we want to be sure uh, that we understand what the Apostle Paul is conveying, I think, is one of the most pivotal passages of the New Testament. And not only pivotal passage, but I believe that the book of Romans is a theological explanation of the death of Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give us the fact that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again the third day. But the book of Romans gives us the theological explanation of those facts. So we have the facts of the gospel, but then we have the explanation of those facts in theological jargon to help us to understand the significance of what Jesus did on Calvary's cross. Romans 8 says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm reading the New American Standard, so in the B clause of verse one, you have who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. In the New American Standard version, that clause is missing, but it's picked up in verse four. So whether or not it's in verse one or verse four doesn't really make a difference, we see it in the text. And so the New American Standard says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for them, for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Verse three is pivotal, watch the text. For what the law could not do Weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Now, I love how the New American Standard reads. It says, what the law could not do, look at it carefully, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did. All right, layman terms. God did what the law couldn't. Oh, Y'all see that? All right, watch this. Sending his own son, participial phrase, explaining how God did it. In the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Purpose statement, verse four. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Is that in your Bible? Uh, if I had to just live for a subject, um, I'm really trying to do something in, in two parts. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be preaching from Genesis 6, but I'm going to relate it to what I'm doing in Romans 8. Uh, and if you had to write down a title, just put a gracious God's justifiable vengeance. Just write that down. A gracious God's justifiable vengeance. Thesis. When you understand the depth of God's grace, then you will understand the extent of his wrath. Listen, anybody who does not accept the depth of God's grace will justifiably face the extent of his wrath. God's grace is so good that when someone makes the decision to reject it, they will face a justifiable vengeance. Now, I want to be careful with that. In other words, uh, God's grace, when you understand how good God's grace is, and it's so enough good, when you understand how deep God's grace runs, it's dangerous to reject God's grace lest you face a justifiable vengeance. 
Now, if you need scripture that by which we pick up the, the language of vengeance, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. Uh, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking uh, vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Once you understand gospel or the evangelion, and when you understand the good news of God's grace, it's dangerous for a person to reject the grace of God because in rejection of God's grace, you will face a justifiable vengeance. Now, uh, I want to start with grace. Tonight, I'll talk vengeance. All right. Here's grace, church. God's grace is so good that it will be misunderstood unless you understand your spiritual dilemma. Nobody can appreciate solutions without understanding your problem. You have a problem you can't fix. And I need you to first embrace you can't fix it. Once you embrace the reality that you can't fix the problem, you start running for solution. Are y'all following me? Here's the problem. I'm going to put it to you in the form of a dilemma. I did it at the Bible study, and I'm going to put it in front of you now. And I won't be long, but listen to your dilemma. All right. Everybody must be in right standing with God. That is a demand. In other words, in order for you to have fellowship with God, you must be deemed by God righteous. Listen to me. Everybody, in order to have fellowship with God, must be deemed righteous. Now, in that regard, there are only two ways a man can be righteous in God's sight. And subsequently, there's only two ways to get to heaven. Now, once you understand how to get righteous, uh, at which there is theoretically only two ways, there is subsequently only two ways to get to heaven. Way number one. Keep all of God's righteous laws perfectly from the age of accountability until death. And you can stand before God and tell God you earned heaven. All right, no, no, you're not feeling me yet because some of you looked at me like you thought you could do it. <laughs> Let me say it one more time. Yeah. If you want to be righteous in God's sight, here's the first way you can do it. You can do it by keeping all of God's righteous demands, God's moral righteousness, his manifested righteousness perfectly from the age of accountability until death and you can stand before God and say God you owe me heaven yes. Yes. what you should be asking me right now is for plan B y'all yes. not feeling me <laughs> right, that, now that's how you can do it that is you can try to get to heaven on your own righteousness that's how you can do it you can try to get to heaven on your own righteousness and, that, and the way you can do that is by keeping all of God's laws perfectly. Everything God has demanded, you keep it perfectly from the age of accountability to your death. And you can stand before God. You don't have to say, God, give me mercy. You don't have to say, God, give me grace. You don't have to say, God, give me a pass. You can say, God, I earn this. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Now, now, plan B. Plan B is you can only get in right standing with God on someone else's righteousness. Y'all got that? I said you, you're either going to do it one or two ways. You either get there on your own or you got to get there on someone else's. I'm going to propose to you today that the only way you get in right standing with God is by the imputed righteousness of Christ Jesus in which God puts on your account 
the righteousness of Christ and treats Christ as if he sinned so he can treat you as if you did. Y'all not getting this. Y'all don't need me. You got to know when to shout, church. You see, we're living in a time when everybody want to shout on cars and houses and secular blessings. And if they don't hear a gospel that deals with their everyday secular problems, they think God is not relevant. But I want to suggest to you that there's nothing more relevant and nothing more important than the righteousness of God placed on your account in which Jesus did for you something that you could not do for yourself. If there's ever a reason for me to give God praise, it's not just over my car and my house and the food on my table, but that somebody hung high, stretched wide, took my place. I come to tell somebody, if you want to know when to shout and when to give God glory, it's not always over stuff that God gives you, but it's over what God have accomplished on Calvary's cross in which God treated Jesus as if he sinned so he can treat you as if you did are you following what I'm saying? That's what you give God praise for. Because if you give God praise only for things, when you lose things, you're going to lose your praise. But I've got to give God praise for something that the devil can't take from me. Are you following what I'm saying? You've got to understand what this thing's about. This thing is that I am a gospel-centered, Christ Jesus preaching kind of preacher. And man, I, in fact, I don't even know what else to preach no more. Except Jesus and what he accomplished on Calvary's cross. Here's your dilemma. The dilemma is simple. You're either going to get there on your own righteousness or you're getting there on somebody else's. What I'm going to show you is a reality. Now, stay, now be honest with me. I need you to be honest with me for two seconds. I sin. I have moments and occasions. When I don't do right. But this verse tells me that there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ. Now, wait a minute now. It's hard to accept that verse when you know how you struggle. Now, I'm not talking about folk who have given themselves over to the practice of sin. I'm not talking about the Romans 6 1 kind of sinner who continues in the habitual behavior of sin. I'm talking about those of us who try to do right, who try to walk straight, but every now and then, y'all not gonna help me, Lord. I don't have no every now and then folk up in here. I got an every now and then kind of problem in which I try to walk straight, I try to do right, I walk the straight and narrow, but every now. Now, if you coming up in church acting like you don't have an every now and then, your problem is not only unrighteousness, your problem is self-righteousness. I said, your problem, and we got a lot of folks sitting in the pew, so self-righteous, can point out everybody else's sin, point out everybody else's struggle, come up in here, act angelic, like you ain't got nothing going on with you. I've come in there to tell you, everybody's got an every now now, man, God's, does God have a provision for my every now? And does God, does, what does God do to deal with, with my every now? All right, now watch this. The text says, and I don't, I don't have time to go through the background of the book of Romans. It, every time I come here, I feel like I'm in Romans. That's all right. Uh, but you understand that the book of Romans is one of the Apostle Paul's greatest didactic epistles by which he explains the great righteousness of God. As a matter of fact, in his thematic statement in Romans chapter 1, verse 14 through 16, he makes quite clear that his thematic thrust is that the righteousness of God has been revealed from faith to faith. For as it is written, the just shall live by faith. When he speaks of the righteousness of God, he's not speaking about the attribute of God's righteousness, but he's talking about the system of God's righteousness by which God puts a man in right standing with himself. It is clear that in Romans chapter 10, this is what the Jews were ignorant of, but the Bible says, my heart's desire in prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. For they have a zeal of God, but it's not according to knowledge. For they've gone about to establish their own, that's the problem. They've gone about to establish their own righteousness. Watch this, having not submitted to the righteousness of God. So whatever the righteousness of God is, it's a system that one submits to. Are y'all following that? 
and the system that we submit to is the modus operandi of how God puts a man in right standing with himself. And he does that through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are y'all following that? Now let me just put before you my premise here and I believe it's true. The gospel is so powerful that it saves me, it sustains me, and it shapes me. It saves me from sin, it sustains me in crisis, and it shapes my behavior. Yeah, are y'all following that? Uh, all right, all right. So, so what, what is the blessing? What is it, Brother Haywood, that God did that we couldn't do? Here it is. Romans 8 says, there is now no kata krima, condemnation. The word condemnation means the verdict of guilty with view to punishment. Now, who is that for? To those that are in Christ Jesus. The verdict of guilty has been lifted in which we are no longer looking in view of punishment. Y'all are missing this. Come here. The reason a Christian could look forward to the second coming is because a Christian goes to judgment day with no condemnation. Uh, let, let me say it again. Because most of y'all scared of the second coming. The way the Bible presents the second coming is not something you run from but it's something you anticipate. And the reason you can anticipate it is because of what you have in Christ. Now church, this is why some folk come to church and got no joy, and ain't mad, you done kicked the dog, smacked the cat, you frustrated, because you don't know what you got in Christ Jesus. And when you don't know what you have, you don't know what to get excited about. Let, let, let me tell you something. Uh, uh, I, back, back home, I, 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 just, I just bought this, this piece of car. And, but this car has an interesting feature on it. It's a piece of car, no big deal. And, and, and the car when I'm driving, uh, just a piece of car, ain't, ain't no big deal. Uh, when I'm driving at high velocity, not that I do that often. Um, I have an every now, I'm not gonna help me alone. But at high velocity, the car squeezes my body to prevent my body from shifting when the car is taking a turn at high speeds. When it first happened to me, I thought something was wrong with my car because it squeezed me so tight. I said, I got to take this thing in because clearly there's something wrong with it. Took it to the dealer. When I got to the dealer, I told the dealer, look, this car is doing something you didn't tell me nothing about. I said, it squeeze me while I'm driving. It's uncomfortable. He said, sir, 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 have you read the manual? On page 56, paragraph three, this is a safety feature. Then that fool looked at me and said, had you read the manual, you would have been excited about something that seemingly scared you. We got a lot of Christians that are scared about the second coming, but had you read the manual, you would know that the thing that got you nervous is the thing that you ought to be excited about. I ain't got time to be scared. I'm waiting for the arrival of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because I've read the manual and I'm excited about what I got in Christ Jesus. God, y'all not ready to have church up in here. Uh, uh, all right, all right. Look, what do you have in Christ? There is now. That's what I got. No condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Uh, do I have a reader? I'm going to do this fast and we're going to go. Uh, 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 my understanding is that there's oxtails here. So, uh, somewhere in this building I'm going to find uh, it, you want to read this for me now listen let me do this quickly because I don't want to get overly theological I, I can sit here and do a long dissertation on this 
But I want you to understand that since chapter 8 begins with the word therefore, therefore is connecting chapter 8 to chapter 7. Which means I cannot understand chapter 8 if I don't understand chapter 7 because chapter 7 is going to present the problem when chapter 8 presents the solution. But you can't appreciate the solution if you don't first know the problem. So I got to visit the problem of chapter 7 so I can have me a shout in chapter 8. But there ain't going to be no shout in chapter 8 if I don't understand the, y'all not going to help me, if I don't understand the problem in chapter 7. So chapter 7 puts sense the problem of righteousness unattained and let me let me say it again chapter 7 presents the problem of righteousness unattained now I want to make sure you understand the reason Jesus has to make you righteous is because you can the reason Jesus has to give you the status oh God watch this watch this gospel God's going to give you the status of righteousness, although you ain't perfectly righteous. Righteousness becomes a state that is a provision for my occasional failure and my practical righteousness. Although God wants me to live righteously, I don't live righteously perfectly. And since I don't live righteously perfectly, God's got to give me a provision because God's legal system leaves me with no hope. Now, what Paul's going to do in chapter 7 is paint the picture of a Jew trying to reach the righteousness of the law, but he's got a problem with another law that Moses' law can't fix. So there is a codified law that cannot answer an indwelling law. Now there is laws in scripture that have different definition, particularly in Romans 7. In Romans 7, Paul's going to talk about a codified law, Mosaic law, and that Mosaic law is not capable of dealing with this other law that's dwelling in my members. Are y'all following this? Now, now if you can just go up to verse well, go to verse 5. I didn't mean to go up that high, but I just thought about it. Something in verse 5 that's real good. And Romans 7, 5, I just want to let you know, everybody up in here got a flesh problem. Uh, you got a... Uh, uh, just in case you don't know it, you got a flesh problem. Now, when I say flesh, flesh is also one of those theological terms that can change definition on you. When I say you got a flesh problem, I don't mean your human body. I mean your carnality. Sometimes flesh is not only referring to the human body, but it is referring to your inordinate desire. All right? And I'm going to show you that Paul defines flesh in Romans 7, 5 as King James, the motions of sin. In another translation, it calls it sinful passions. Now watch Romans 7, 5. What does it say? For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin. All right. When we were in the, the flesh. flesh, then he defines it. What is it? The motions of sins. All right. If you read another translation without getting into the Greek text, it means sinful passions. When you were in the flesh, well, what does it mean to be in the flesh? It means to be controlled or infected by sinful passions. Everybody's got a flesh problem. Watch this. That plays out in your flesh. You have flesh that plays out in flesh. All right, you got sinful passions that play out in your physical body. Now, don't condemn me if I lie, if your flesh caused you to fornicate. Both of us have a flesh problem that just played out differently. Everybody's got a flesh problem, but everybody's flesh doesn't play out the same way. Are y'all following that? That's why we got to stop tripping. You know, somebody mess around and you find out publicly somebody got sin and then you sit there like you ain't got no flesh problem. You start sending them to hell. You don't try to help. You don't try to minister to them. You don't try to restore them. All you want to do is show folk you're not as bad as they are. But I've got news for you, baby. You got a flesh problem just like that person. The only difference is it plays out differently. That's, 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 verse, that's verse number. 
that's verse 5, right? All right, now go down to verse 7. Go down to verse 7. I'm almost done, I promise. Romans 7 says what? Verse 7 says what? What shall we say then? Oh, man, I keep forgetting y'all are technological. I could technically read this myself. Y'all y'all pray for us back home. We, we in this building project, trying to get this thing done. We got 1,100 folk coming to church in a building that holds 700. And, and in the building, they got one office. And it ain't even mine. <laughs> Y'all pray for your son. <laughs> Praise God, I ain't even got no office, man. Folk parking down the block, cars getting broken into. We right in the heart of the ghetto. And uh, y'all pray for us that things work out. Amen. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Now watch this. Didn't I just tell you you got a flesh problem? Now in this verse he says what it is is a lust problem. Now watch this. Codified law, Moses law, exposed your lust problem but couldn't fix it. Are y'all saying this? Except the law had said thou shalt not covet. Watch verse 8. Verse 8 says what? Let's go down to verse 8. Well you can read it. Go to verse 8. Uh, but sin taketh occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law sin was what? If, if the, in other words, what law does, law exposes sin, but it cannot fix. This is why when God put Israel under a legal system like Moses' law, it was a schoolmaster to lead them to Christ. Because that law couldn't save. It could only point to the remedy. Yeah, y'all see that? All right, now watch this. All right, I'm, I'm almost done. Check. Go down to verse 10. Go down to verse 10. Go down to verse 10. My brother, you got it? All right. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto. I don't have time. Check this out. Check this out. I thought that law was life. But man. What was ordained for life killed me. Yes. Jesus help me. The law is holy, yeah. it's righteous, yeah. but it killed me. Yeah. Can, I, can I put something on your table that I think you should think about? All through Jesus' ministry, he would put back into proper perspective the law so that the audience of the Jews, scribes and Pharisees, would realize they couldn't keep it. All right. Pharisees got so self-righteous because they reduced the law to a point where they thought they could attain righteousness by it. But the problem is Jesus had to elevate that law put it back in its rightful place so that the Jew would understand you need me. I have not come to destroy the law but I have come to fulfill it because you couldn't. Y'all are missing this. Y'all remember the rich young ruler? Rich young ruler just as arrogant as he could be. Say, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Yes, sir. Jesus said, watch this. What does the law say? Yeah. Oh, God. He said the law says this, 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 and he ended with, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, okay, let's see if you believe the law you claim. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and let me see if you love your neighbor as yourself. And the rich young ruler went away at that moment he died the law that was for life killed him because he realized he was not in harmony with a law that he thought he could reach its righteousness do y'all see what Jesus did he would put that law right back where it belonged are y'all following me all right now that's what Paul's doing here Paul's saying that law that was ordained to life he said that law it killed me why did 
did it kill you, Paul? Because it revealed my flesh problem. Y'all seeing this? Now somebody up in here needs to realize, yeah, I don't know why y'all looking at me like you ain't got no flesh problem. Right? If God left you to yourself, there was no way that you were going to be in right standing with God on the basis of your moral perfection. Are y'all following that? And God just said, thou shalt, thou shalt not, thou shalt, thou shalt not, and put you under that system and left you to yourself without Christ. Ain't no way he was going to hell. Now y'all see it, church? We got to start appreciating grace. Are y'all following with me? All right, now watch this. All right, let's finish this up. Now y'all know the rest of this. Look at verse number 11. Verse 11 says what? For sin, taken occasion by commandment, yeah. deceived me, yeah. and by it slew me. Next verse. Wherefore the law is holy. The law is holy. And the commandment holy. Commandment holy. And just. Just. And good. Good. Read. Was, was then that which is good made death unto me. Read. God forbid. God said I didn't ordain it for it to be death for you. But here's the problem. Read. But sin, but sin, sin, that sin might appear me. more sinful, working death, work in me. death in me by that which is good, by that which is good, but sin by the commandment. That's why the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. Go ahead, read that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Watch this, read, read. For we know that the law is spiritual, the, the law, let's have that. Ain't nothing wrong with the law, baby. The law is. Now, by spiritual, it simply means it reflects God's righteousness. Are you following that? That's all that means. The law is spiritual. It's not the law of the spirit. But the law is spiritual in that the law reveals God's righteousness. The law is spiritual. What's the problem, Paul? But I am. That's what everybody need to come to right there. You ain't never going to be saved. If you don't first embrace that you can't. Yes, yes, now, now watch this. Here's the beauty of it. Oh, Jesus. God does not make you wait till you get righteous to come to him. He wants you to come to him as you are. Jesus, help me. You ever met somebody that says, I don't want to be a Christian yet because I got to get some stuff right first? But they don't understand, ain't no getting it right. There's no getting it right first, baby. Come as you are. Listen, watch this. Watch this. I am carnal, sold under sin. Now I got to fast forward with this. He starts saying, well, after Paul paints that picture that he's carnal and that he could not reach the righteousness of the law, he starts using language like when I would do good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What is the good in the text? The good in the text is the reaching for the righteousness of God. That's the good in the text. The, this, is not, this does not mean that you don't do some stuff good. This is a specific good that you don't do perfectly. It's the good of God's righteousness. When I would do good, what's the problem? Evil. And the thing that I hate, I find myself doing so I hate it with my mind but I love it with my flesh and I gotta love hate relationship with sin that's got me in a tug of war and I find that sin has taken up occasion and it's not me that do it but sin that oh wretched man that I am who shall? Y'all gonna help me along in here. Who's gonna rescue me from the fact that I cannot keep the righteousness of God, but I'm pulled by my flesh? Paul said, I thank Christ Jesus. Are y'all seeing this? Jesus fixes the problem. The question is, how? Now let's start the sermon in chapter 8. There is now. How? Oh, wait a minute. Church, if I struggle like that, how can there not be condemnation? 
Do you see this? Paul said, I can't get it perfectly right. Yet, if you get in Christ, God has lifted the verdict. Guilty. Of which I'm no longer headed for punishment. Come here, church. When you come up out the water of baptism, you still have the capacity to sin. Watch it. But you ain't got to be condemned by it. All right, let's read chapter 8. We're done. We, I promise we're done. And then if you reject this, now you mess around and reject this. Tonight, I'm going to tell you what happened when you reject this. Because if God went that far, you're not going to help me. Look. I mean, if God did all of that for a wretch like me to be saved, and then I fool around and say, no, thank you. Church, you don't want to fool around and turn down this gracious gift otherwise you're going to have a justifiable vengeance All right, read verse 2 for the law of the spirit of life now, in now Jesus. The, the law of the sin and death is what was dwelling in my members in other words law there means a ruling principle ruling now that's not codified law Moses law is codified but codified law cannot fix my indwelling law the, the dominance of sin in my life could not be fixed by codified law. Yes? All right, now watch this. For the law of the spirit of life, the dominance of the spirit through the gospel of Jesus Christ has set me free from the law of sin. Watch this. The law of sin and death is the dominance of sin that causes spiritual death. I've been freed from the dominance of that in my life. Even though sometimes I still sin. Now why is it fixed? Because the blood of Jesus. Oh God. The blood of Jesus is not only available for past sin. But it's available for present sin. But it's not just available for present sin. It's available for future. Even sins I have not done yet. The blood of Christ is available to keep me in right. Y'all, y'all, I, I think I've done this before. I think I've done this before. I've probably done this before. Uh, this cadence. I, did I tell y'all I was in a cadet program? I told y'all. And, and, and. I told some of y'all maybe. Yes, I, I told you I was in the cadet program. And I told you in the cadet program, any military folk in here? All right, good. So, so in the cadet program, we had to march in cadence. Yeah, yeah. But every now and then, somebody got out of step. Yes, but they would tell you, don't stop walking. They would say, what you do is skip. Get back. Y'all remember that? I told you that last year. In other words, you, you skip to get back in step. All of us will get out of step. But if you confess and repent the blood of Christ. Y'all got it? If I acknowledge my need for the blood. The Bible says, now listen, the Bible says walk in the light. Listen, church, walking in the light don't mean you don't sin. How do you know? Because the text says walk in the light as he is in the light and the blood keeps cleansing you. Well, walking in the light can mean no sin because in the light is where the blood cleanses. Y'all missed that. Text says walk in the light as he is in the light. He is just and faithful to forgive us. And the blood of Jesus cleanses. Who does it cleanse? The folk walking in the light. Which means walking in the light. Don't mean I'm perfect. Walking in 
the light means I live in acknowledgement, confession that I need Christ and his blood keeps cleansing me of all our, are y'all saying that? Some, you know, walking in light don't mean I'm walking a straight and narrow and then I'm on a tightrope here. No, no, no. You walk in a mindset of acknowledging my need for the finished work of Jesus. Anybody that does not acknowledge their need for the blood can't get the benefits of the blood. Don't have time to put that in the backdrop of Gnostics. Gnostics didn't de think they needed Jesus. In fact, denied that he came in the flesh. They claimed that they had a light, a knowledge that nobody else had. John said them jokers ain't got no real knowledge. They don't have the light. The real light is God. And we got to walk in that light. And if you walk in that light, the blood keeps. Watch this. How does God do it? Y'all ready? The, the law. The, uh, go back to verse 3. Or well, verse 2. The law of sin set me free. Uh, the, law of sin, uh, the law of the spirit, excuse me, of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Yes? Look at verse 3. Here's where we shout. Here's where we end. For what the law? Most, Moses' law. That legal system. What that law could not do. Watch this. And that it was weak. Now, when it says the law was weak, it's not really talking about the holiness of the law. But it means it was weak in that it could not be remedy to your flesh problem. Weak through the flesh means it could not fix. All right, y'all not feeling it. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God. Ah. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God. When the law couldn't fix my sin problem and the law could not address my carnality, when I couldn't keep God's law perfectly and I couldn't keep his righteousness, God took care of the point. Now, how did God do it? Watch it. Y'all see it right there, don't you? Sending his own son in the likeness of and what is it? Why don't you? Oh God, Jesus, I'm about to run around this building. Watch. watch. And for sin. Yes. Condemned. Yes. Church, y'all ready for this? For sin means Jesus was sent to die as the sin offering. Watch this. When God sent Jesus to die as the sin offering, yeah. Jesus as the sin offering uh -huh. condemned sin. sin. Yeah. 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 Amen. How did God save me? God condemned yeah. what had you condemned. Judgment happened at the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he judges, condemns sin, which is the thing that had you condemned. So God condemned what had you condemned so you ain't got to be condemned. God condemned what had you condemned so you don't have to be condemned. He judges sin at the cross. And those that accept that gift watch this. Those that accept that gift look at verse 4. I'm going to show you what the gift is. Those who accept that gift that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in you didn't fulfill it. Come on. But when Jesus died on the cross, his righteousness is placed on your account. And now God treats you as if you are righteous and you didn't earn it. Are y'all getting this? 
Then he characterizes the people of God. He says, who walk not after the flesh. Wait a minute, but I still struggle with my flesh. Yeah, but you don't live a life that's in the rule of your flesh. Because you're now in Christ where you have the Holy Spirit and you're no longer in the flesh. Well, all right, look at Romans 8, 9. I promise I'm done. I know I got to finish. Romans 8, 9. I promise I'm done. Look at verse 9 and I'll just show you. Uh, you it, it, stop claiming to be something you not no more. Well, I'm still in my flesh. No, you're not. 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 You may still struggle with sin, but you're not in the rule of your flesh. No more. Stop claiming to be something that you're not. It's hard to be, it's hard to change behavior when you're still claiming an old identity. Watch this. But you aren't, well, there it is. But you Christians are not in the flesh, but in, that's where you are. Are y'all saying this? Church, Jesus condemned sin so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. My praise and my worship is within the full cognizance that Jesus accomplished something for me that I could not accomplish for myself. So the reason I no longer lose my joy, the reason I no longer find myself depressed and find myself frustrated over my occasional failure is because Jesus has already fixed this thing where the fight is already fixed. What I've got to do is hold on by faith, trusting the finished work of Jesus Christ. I'm reminded that sometimes you have folk that fix fights and you find that sometimes the, fight, the coach of the fighter will go behind to the judges and he'll pay a price and say no matter how it looks in the ring, make sure my fighter wins. Even if he's on the ropes, make sure my fighter wins. And the reason I want my fighter to win is because I'm paying this price in advance. And this price ought to serve as a means of you fixing that fight. I've come today to tell you when Jesus died on Calvary's cross, he paid a price to the judges. When he paid a price to the judge, he said this fight is now fixed. No matter how it looks, I might look like I'm getting beat up, but the fight is fixed. I might get knocked down, but the fight is fixed. If I can just hold on by faith, my fight is already fixed. I've come to tell you, church, I tell my folk back home. I said, that's why when you come to church, you ain't got no business. Being depressed, mad, and upset. God has done something for you that nobody else can. And if you have been here, when you come to the assembly, there ought not be something in you that doesn't have some leaping joy, some celebration. Because when you know what God has done, you can't help but to start celebrating what God has done on your behalf. Let me tell you a story and I'm done. There was a, there was a boy that found a dog dead in the street. Looked like he was dead. Young boy went up to the dog, picked the dog up, took the dog back home laid the dog down and he started to nurse the dog he started to bind up his wounds and next thing you know the dog starts leaning up and when the dog started leaning up uh the boy went and got some dog food best dog food he can find put the dog food down the dog started eating weeks later the dog could not only sit up he could stand up and now the dog started feeling stronger and his health started coming back to him and the dog started walking before long the dog starts running and the reason the dog is running is because that boy saved him from the street, nursed him in the house, gave him the best food he could find. Now the dog, every time he saw the master, dog would start jumping, dog would start leaping. Every time he was in the presence of the boy, he would start jumping, start leaping. When the boy walked the dog outside, neighbors started seeing the dog. Dog kept jumping around the boy. Neighbor said, why does that dog keep jumping? Why does that dog keep moving? Why don't you tell the dog keep still? The boy said, the reason this dog won't keep still is because I saved him from being dead in the street. Nursed him back to hell. Got him back on his feet. I've come to tell somebody, I can't help myself. Sometimes I start leaping. 
sometimes I start jumping when I'm in the presence of Jesus. I can't help myself because Jesus did something for me that I couldn't do. I don't have time to be sophisticated. Don't have time to look at you. I got to get God some praise for everything that he's done for me. Do I have any leapers up in here? Do I have any jumpers up in here? Do I have any shouters up in here? Somebody ought to say, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you accomplished. Are y'all following this? If you're here, if you're here, if you're here, if you're here, oh, God, don't y'all make me start preaching. I'm getting happy now. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. That's why you shout, church. I might lose my house, but I ain't lost my shout. You might walk out on me, but I ain't lost my shout. I might lose my house. I ain't lost my shout. Might lose my car. But yeah, I'm go here. If you hear, don't say no to this gracious gift. How do you get it? How do you, thank you. How do you get it? 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 There is no condemnation to them that are. If you want this blessing, it is a located blessing. Where's the blessing? It's, it's. See, I'm not saved based on perfect behavior. I'm saved based on position. When I get in Christ, his righteousness covers me. Well, hey, what you started the sermon and you said, there's two ways to get to heaven. Plan A don't work for me. But if you get baptized for the remission of your sins, when you go down in the water and you come up and you're baptized into Christ, Romans 6, when you get in Christ, you come up clothed with Jesus. Now when I stand before God, God don't even see me. He sees his son Jesus. I don't know about you, but that kind of message don't only save me, it sustains me. And it won't only sustain you, it'll shape your behavior. Grace doesn't endorse sin, it'll teach you to have a transformed life. Somebody right now is ready to become a Christian. Somebody right now, somebody right now is ready to become a child of God. Somebody right now is ready to become a child of God. Somebody right now is ready to say yes to King Jesus. The devil is going to try to keep you right where you are. The devil would love for you to say no to this message. God is saying, I'm not asking you to go fix your sin. I'm asking you to be released from. Yeah. Amen. I had an interesting experience where I preached in a city wide with another preacher. This preacher said something that disturbed me. He said, uh, did it after I preached, as a matter of fact. He got up behind me and said, repentance does not only mean what Haywood just said. Haywood said it means to change your mind. But it really means to go back and fix everything you broke. Oh, no. He said repentance means to fix your sin. Now, I know what he was after, and I won't even bring that up here. But let me tell you something. You're going to be up way past midnight. Yes. Trying to fix every sin you've ever done? Play a play. I'm sorry. I, I thought I was back in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm sorry. Player, that don't work up in here. Now you, you had to take that somewhere else. 
listen, there are, just practically, there's some sins you do, you can't fix. You can only change your behavior. What do you tell a woman that has a baby out of wedlock? How does she fix her baby? She can't fix what she did, but she can determine not to do it again. That's repentance. What you gonna tell a man that murders somebody? He ain't got no resurrection power. How he gonna fix that? He can only determine not to do it again. When you repent, you determine to the best of my ability, Lord, I'm not gonna do that again. And then you make the great confession, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and then you get baptized for the remission of your sins. And when you come up, God will put you in the state of righteousness. And he'll do that right now today. Why don't you all stand with me? Because somebody's ready. Somebody's ready to do it right now. What you're going to do is come forward, and we're going to ask you one question. And that is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you affirm that to be true, we're going to baptize you right now for the remission of your sins. Look, ain't no sense leaving this gift on the table. I didn't just preach all that to show you I can preach or that I had any knowledge. Uh, the question is, what you going to do with this gift? Because if you leave it on the table, God is going to tell you tonight, if you come back tonight, if you reject my gracious gift... There's only one thing left. Justifiable vengeance. That's what's left. And I'm going to show you that tonight out of Genesis chapter 6. If you're here and you want to be saved, why don't you come as we sing. Song of invitation.